is ever staying still and the dots moving, it's, it's always quantity uh, changing. The only time we talk about a change in demand or a change in supply is when the entire graph moves, either to the left or over there to the right. So I'm gonna focus on demand because that's what I got up here. Um, <clears throat> if the whole curve, so let's just do one at a time, I won't confuse you. If the entire curve shifted over, it's like a little mat here. Uh, if the entire shift curve, uh, curve shifted over to the right, uh, that's called a change in demand. All right. Not quantity. All right, uh, these are only moved, a curve will only move for something big, like a big change, all right? Uh, would I say my demand increased or decreased if my whole curve moves over to the right? Are more people buying my stuff or less people? More, yeah, because it's, it's moving to the right, the number of people that are willing to buy it increases. Try to think about it yourself maybe before I give you the answers for this. What could cause the demand for my product across the board for all prices to move, make people more willing to buy my stuff. What could possibly do this? There's a lot of things. Um, say like the water supply that you're getting from like your sinks and stuff is like bad, the water, like water bottles and stuff. Okay, all right, all right, that's good. So what I would say in that case is uh, you're talking about substitutes. All right, so yeah, I like that example. So if I'm a water bottle, water bottle, water bottle, I don't know why that was such a tongue twister. Water, no. Water bottle selling company. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm in a town in the, like Flint or something where the water supply goes bad. What's everybody gonna have to do to get water? Go to you. They're gonna go to me, right. So my uh, demand's gonna increase. So that is kind of like a substitute. If I'm selling bottled water, uh, certainly a substitute could be people's tap water. And if they can't use it, then they're gonna have to get water somewhere else. Bottled water is probably the next cheapest option. All right, uh, so that'd be a case of substitutes. So yeah, if my demand shifted over to the right, I could probably be sure that uh, some substitute good, some competitor of mine, uh, lost sales for whatever reason, right? Maybe, maybe if I'm a Powerade, uh, and then Gatorade has some like mass recall because there's E. coli in their Gatorade or something like that. That hasn't happened, by the way, don't sue me. So, um, but this is just a theoretical example. Uh, they would have to recall it like Chipotle did like two or three years ago. Uh, and if you can't go to Chipotle or you can't buy Gatorade, you're gonna buy the alternative, like whatever it is. Uh, so if I'm Powerade and Gatorade has some recall, uh, a lot of those customers are gonna go to me. So my, at least temporarily, my demand curve will shift over. More people are willing to buy my stuff. All right, so substitutes is one. What's another one? We're talking about four in this class. Like um, shortage, like how helium is. So okay. Get a price increase on it. You could get a price increase on it, um, but that wouldn't. That would just move the dot up and down. That wouldn't increase. That wouldn't increase people's demand for it. I like what you're thinking, though. You're right. So that's scarcity. That could affect my price. But I'm, I'm talking the entire ship uh, curve shifts over. Maybe an increase the minimum wage. Yes. Okay. Cool. Income. This is called the income effect. I gave you this example before uh, when I was talking about money supply and the multiplier effect. So um, the big example I gave was in and out. If all of you guys had only $5 to your name and you had to like live off of that for weeks, you would probably not the next day go to in and out and spend it, right? You would wanna stretch that money out so you can live longer, correct? We can all agree on that. What if um, <clears throat> there was like, a Lathrop City tax refund. Like they had overtaxed the city for whatever reason and they gave the refund back to you guys and you all got $1,000. Would you be more likely to buy in and out the next day? Yeah. Absolutely, okay. So what we could say is, uh, I know that's not actually a part of like your work income, but anytime a, the population gets a lot of money, whether their uh, the economy's doing good or people at a, a factory get a raise, or you get a tax rebate, uh, you get money back, people are gonna spend it. They won't spend all of it, most of them won't, uh, but they'll definitely spend some of it. So that's called the income effect, and that can go both ways. So can this, actually. Um, so if uh, everybody gets money, whether it's a raise or a tax rebate, the economy's doing well, generally, the whole demand curve shifts over to the right. Could the same thing happen in reverse? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, if we start here, and uh, we have another recession, or taxes increase, uh, or you know, 
expenses increase, whatever it might be, or um, uh, there's inflation but your wages don't go up, that'll cause people's incomes to drop. They have less money, so of course they're gonna buy less stuff and the whole thing shifts to the left because uh, they're willing to buy less, they have less money. Cool, there's two more. You guys are doing well so far. Like a recession? Oh, that would be part of the income effect. You're totally right though, absolutely. Oh, I forgot to get money for that. I think, who said the, uh, who had the income one? That was you guys. And then the substitute one? What do you think? Oh, actually, I got yours. Okay, what else could? Like the availability of an item. The availability of an item. That would be more so dependent on uh, the price. That would move it up and down the curve. All right, because that, that's a scarcity issue. So if you're talking scarcity, it's only going to move it on the curve. It's not going to change the whole curve. All right, we'll do a couple more uh, guesses. Um, I don't know if it would fall a substitute, but like if your competitor goes out of business. Yeah, that would, that would be a substitute. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, if, if your Pepsi and Coke goes out of business, they're not going to, at least not anytime soon. Yeah, Pepsi would get a bunch more business and it would shift all of their demand uh, this direction. But likewise, if, if Pepsi got really popular all of a sudden, and, and for, for whatever reason, I don't know, they market it better or something stupid or they change something, uh, then Coke would lose a lot of customers because Pepsi dropped their prices or they got more popular and the Coke uh, curve would shift back to the left. All right, what you got? Um, what if it's on like, that's getting rarer to get? Getting rarer to get. That would be a scarcity thing. So that's right. just going to make the price change. All right, cool. All right, so I'll give this one. You guys are great, though. I, I like how you're thinking about it. So what will cause my whole curve to shift could, this one's more rare, but it's possible, uh, if the price of a complement changes. All right, here's an example. Let's say there's some, like, uh, peanut fungus, like the old potato famine, if you guys ever heard of that, uh, that caused, wreaked havoc in, in, in Europe. Let's say there's, like, a peanut famine. Like there's some fungus that spreads in there's a peanut fungus, so there's way less peanuts available in the world. What's gonna happen to the price of all peanut butter? It's gonna increase. It's gonna increase a lot, right? Because there's way less peanuts, uh, so it, it's going to increase the price of that peanut butter. All right. Generally, do people buy peanut butter with the intention of using bread or jelly with it? Yeah. They usually do, right? Not many people just eat peanut butter. Some do, but not many do. I know, you put on celery and other things. I have too, don't get me wrong. I am, I have been guilty of just being like, Whoa, before, because it's I like it. But I would never just buy a jar of peanut butter and just eat it by itself, uh, purely. I always have it with bread at some point or an English muffin or something. So if peanut butter, uh, because of the peanut fungus, got really expensive, uh, if peanut butter drastically increased in price, do you think people are going to buy as much jelly or as much as many English muffins. No, they're not, right? Because they, they can't, it's not as affordable. So these are kind of extreme, but if a complimentary good, something I usually buy with it, uh, goes way up or way down, that could move my demand as well. So in this case, obviously, with the uh, peanut shortage, it's gonna drop my demand, right? If I'm an English muffin seller or a, t a bread seller or a jelly seller, because less people are buying peanut butter and uh, my whole demand curve is gonna shift over to the left. All right, what happens though if they find a cure for this fungus and uh, peanuts all of a sudden are back to normal and the price of peanut butter goes down, what's gonna happen to my uh, demand curve then if I'm bread or jelly or English muffins? So the peanut prices go back and the peanut butter price goes way down. What's it gonna, what? Yeah, more people gonna want my stuff, my English muffins, my bread or whatever. So what's gonna happen to this demand curve? It's gonna go which direction? Right. Right, exactly. You guys got that. All right, and the last one, I think, is, it's called a change in taste. I don't mean like actual taste, like peanut butter taste. I mean like <clears throat> popularity. All right, I'll give you an example. There was a, a book of which I've forgotten the name. It's about American Indians, the Comanche tribe. Uh, almost nobody would ever just go buy this book. But, you guys know who Joe Rogan is? Some of you do, some of you don't. Yeah. He has the most famous podcast by a large margin. Uh, millions of people listen to him. Uh, he talks to all kinds of guests, and he doesn't like, you know, filter them. He takes people from both sides of the spectrum. He'll, he'll take anybody. So he's the most popular podcast by a large margin. Uh, millions of people listen to him. He read the book, this book about the American Indians, and he talked about how great it was on his podcast. And uh, all of a sudden, 
this random book who had sold very little copies this is about a very specific uh, American Indian tribe uh, and their history. All of a sudden, uh, their whole demand curve just, <clears throat> like people just wanted that book. Uh, the demand for it spiked phenomenally uh, and they were able to increase the price because there were so many people demanding it. Uh, and it basically shifted the whole curve uh, for this book to the right. What happened? Exactly, right. So we, we would call that a change in taste because people wanted this book. All right, it became popular. All right, so more people hear about it than they like, oh, this is a great book. And then, then they tell their friends or they hear about it or they see it on his podcast or another podcast uh, and it grows in popularity. So anytime you have something that becomes popular, whether a celebrity endorses it or you just made something badass and it did really good on its own, if that becomes popular, your whole demand curve is going to shift. Way more people are going to want it. So you're going to make way more, and you're going to be able to increase the uh, price. Could that happen in reverse? Yeah. Absolutely. Your, your, whatever you're making could go out of style or become obsolete. Here's an example. Do you guys know what uh, cassette players are? Yeah. Okay, at least you know what they are. Sweet. Uh, I mean, honestly, even me, I only s really saw them when I was a little kid, because by the time I was in junior high, CD players uh, were like the thing to have. Uh, but You've gone from cassettes to CDs to like MP3s to iPods, and now everybody just has their stuff on their phone. Uh, but every time you move to the next type of music uh, uh, vehicle, right, whether it's a cassette player or a DVD, or sorry, not DVD, CD uh, or MP3 or whatever, you kind of like no longer buy the cassettes. And then when we moved on to MP3 players and iPods, we no longer buy the CDs, right, or even going for the back of records. So when something goes out of style, because it's, uh, I mean, like, why would you ever want to listen to a cassette? You guys know how you listen to cassettes? Yes. You hit play, and it plays whatever song or video you have, and then if you want to go back, you have to, like, hit rewind and wait <laughs> for it to go. And then that, that film over time gets, like, deteriorated and broken, and it stops working. It's just like, damn it, that's stupid. Uh, but that's the best thing they had at the time. All right? But once they invent something better, and it becomes more popular, Nobody wants the cassettes or the records or the CDs anymore. So what happens to their demand curve? It's going to go down. So which way is it going to move? Yeah, it's going to move to the left. All right. So we, we refer to that as a change in taste, right? And if you want to think of that as just popularity or usefulness, utility, uh, that works, right? But anytime something becomes popular, like when EDM became popular, uh, what was his name? Zed or whatever his name is. The, 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 the one of the main guys that pushed it. Oh, Skrillex too. You guys ever heard of Skrillex? Yeah. They're like the first ones to do that. When that music hit mainstream and got popular, boom, the demand for that music, uh, Skrillex's music, Zed and that, that genre, uh, went way, way up. But if a genre ever gets like out of style, like, uh, what's one that went out of style? <laughs> Jazz. Jazz? Yeah. I mean, okay, he, he has a point. It was much more popular in the 20th century, between like the 1920s and the 1950s. So there was a point where people were less excited about uh, uh, jazz, and so inevitably the demand would decrease and you'd see it go this way. Um, I'm trying to think of one that like went out. Like what's a style that like was popular? And oh, there's a specific type of rock called grunge that was popular in the 90s, and all of a sudden people stopped liking it. And so all of a sudden the demand for that goes way down. Oh, here, now I'm remembering all kinds. 80s hair bands, those used to be super popular. You guys have no idea what those are, do you? 80s hair bands. Like, it was a bunch of rock bands that had super long hair, and they would always do the thing and, and all that. Uh, I'm trying to think of names, like, there's like names like Poison. Like, some of the last ones were like Guns N' Roses. Metallica cut their hair eventually, but they kept playing music. So like all those older uh, 80s bands were super popular. Um, and then all of a sudden, 90s, 2000s comes around, people stop listening to it as much, uh, and it goes down. All right, that's a change in taste. All right, last slide, and then uh, we're done with this, we'll uh, go ahead and play our video. Yeah. Uh, next time I do a drinking break, I'm not gonna let you do that, but I have to break next time. All right, um, so this is more about individual decision making or individual uh, business decision making. Um, when you're making a good or you're consuming and you're, and you're considering buying a good, uh, there's the concept that we, we've heard about before. Um, well, actually, I'm not gonna tell you what it was. It's about how much additional satisfaction you get for purchasing an additional unit of that good or service. 
Yeah, marginal utility. So uh, when you're a seller or a buyer, you're obviously looking to uh, offer or purchase a product that uh, has good uh, marginal utility. Positive means buying additional unit makes me happier. Negative means if I buy an additional unit, I'm less satisfied, all right? So there's a few goods that could fall into this category. And again, if you're, a, especially if you're a consumer, you're looking for a product that uh, has good marginal utility. Uh, so either if it is worse when you purchase the next one, it's not much worse, or preferably, uh, it's the same or better when you purchase the next one. We talked about this yesterday. I think, uh, I think Julia had it, uh, an option. Uh, the first example is a negative marginal utility. I'm just gonna abbreviate as MU. Uh, that's the one we all know. If you went and bought 10 stickers bars, not all 10 of those are gonna taste equally as good, right? You're gonna get uh, more satiated or you're gonna be like overwhelmed with sweetness or you're gonna become more full or whatever it is. So each one theoretically is gonna progressively get less satisfying. I mean, that just makes sense. You can definitely get yourself tired of um, any particular food. Like if you go in and out every single day, uh, there are some people that can actually do that. Like I know there's a guy that's had like 29,000 Big Macs at McDonald's or something like that. He's gone like every day, twice a day for however many years. Yeah, it's disgusting from my perspective, but he's, he really likes it for whatever reason. So for him, a Big Mac margin utility uh, would not be negative. It's at least positive, if not just you know flat. Uh, most of us though, if you went to McDonald's every day for twice a day or, or any fast food place or had any food every single day, multiple times a day, you'd probably get tired of it, right? Because that has negative marginal utility. Each one after gets a little less satisfying, all right? However, if you can find a product that has like a flat marginal utility or one that's slightly positive, uh, then you're going to uh, likely have more success. But you can also take things that normally experience negative marginal utility, like let's take the, uh, um, let's see here. Let's take the in and out example, all right? If I buy two uh, four by fours or two by twos, whatever you get, uh, the second one is almost always gonna be less satisfying because you're, you're, you're more full than you were before. All right, unless you have like an, uh, a small intestine disorder where you don't get the chemical signal that you're full and you never feel full and you just keep eating and eating. But that's a very small percentage of people. Uh, what could I do as in and out to uh, actually make that second burger, which technically should taste less good because you're more full and you've already had one. How can I make that one as or more satisfying than the first one? I think Julia found this out yesterday. Uh, like yeah, exactly. You can offer some sort of sale for the second purchase, like buy one, get one half off, buy one, get one free or whatever. And that's going to make people more likely to buy it because uh, that improved their marginal utility. So that's known as positive uh, marginal utility. I wrote the whole thing out for this one, whatever. That's where uh, it actually increases uh, the satisfaction for a purchase, and sales are a good way to do that. If I buy two of the exact same item, like what, say I bought two of these exact same shirts, um, and one, the second one's free or half off, I'm probably gonna enjoy that purchase or feel more satisfied for it. I could just wear two in case I screw one up, like I spill on it or my kid ruins it, or I could give it away as a gift, whatever it is. My satisfaction will be higher because I paid less or didn't pay anything for it, all right? Um, addictive substances too can sometimes have a flat or positive mar uh, marginal utility. Uh, cigarettes could potentially fall in this category. Um, caffeinated drinks could uh, because if I wake up and I'm kind of tired and I have a coffee, that, that feels good, right? This doesn't affect me by the way, I hate coffee, but I know most people do, or at least adults. Uh, they like have to have their cup of coffee or whatever. What happens after like, four to six hours when that caffeine goes away. Do they feel great? No, no they, they usually feel worse than they did before. So they have to get another coffee uh, to keep that going. Uh, so they at least have a flat, if not positive, uh, marginal utility there. So addictive substances can, being you're all looking at certain people who drink coffee, um, uh, <laughs> this person, um, uh, addictive substances could theoretically have a positive marginal utility, uh, as long as they're not overdosing on caffeine or something like that. Uh, but yeah, they need to maintain that. So those are a couple of goods. But uh, the last point we need to talk about, and I think you guys understand this too, um, when you're a buyer or a consumer, you always have to think about your decisions and the decisions of others because you only have so much money 
and you only have so much time. So even if I'm a business and I've got 100 employees and however many materials, I can only make so many units, so I have to decide which ones to make. So for example, um, I don't know the sales for McDonald's in particular, but I would imagine they have fish fillets. I know them, I don't know who buys them, but they're there. Um, and then they have the other like traditionally beef patty burgers, right? We'll just say Big Mac, we'll take an example. If they were to focus more of their uh, time and money on producing more fish fillets, that means they cannot produce more of the Big Macs, right? So they always decide which one they think customers are going to uh, buy. It's easier once you're established because you kind of know the patterns for people. Like, oh, okay, we generally send this many, sell this many fish fillets in a month or a quarter and this many Big Macs. So you can kind of produce to meet that. But when you start off, you have to try to like anticipate, which can be difficult, what people will want or not. Because again, it's opportunity cost. The money or time you spend on making one thing or buying it because you only got so much money, uh, you give up the alternative. Uh, so that's an important factor to uh, consider when you are uh, running a business or you're just buying something. And again, it's always harder at the beginning because you don't know what people are gonna really jump on or not want or kind of want. All right, I had that, I had that issue when I was making my uh, uh, teacher stuff online. Like I made a bunch of things, but I, I had no idea what was gonna be popular or be uh, in high demand and what wasn't. Uh, and I was wrong about some. Uh, and I was right about some. So some I thought for sure would be super popular and they were just kind of eh. Uh, and some I was just like, oh, I'll put it out there just, just to have and it like blew up, right? Uh, so you, you don't always know exactly what it's gonna be, but um, if you're producing things or you're dedicating time towards them, uh, you can only do it to one thing, you give up the alternative. So uh, opportunity cost uh, is a uh, major factor in decision making for businesses uh, and for buyers. It's good. You can't spend what you already paid. You can't uh, dedicate time that you've already dedicated. There's only a certain amount of it, all right? And if you guess wrong, it might hurt you. Like if you overproduce, you're like, oh man, this shoe is gonna sell like crazy and you, build, you make a whole bunch of them uh, and, it become, and it doesn't become popular, well, you just wasted a lot of time and money on that that you could have put towards something else that, that was selling. Like I know right now, um, I am sure that all Kobe things are just flying off the shelves because uh, he just recently passed away in the helicopter crash. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm positive that companies are producing a, a bunch of uh, Kobe themed things. Um, but yeah, that was sad though. My brother really liked him. <clears throat> he followed him since he was a kid when he went into, uh, came into the league uh, as a high schooler. So anyways, uh, any questions about that? Mm -hmm. All right, sweet.